Hi, everyone. This is uh, Kendra Albert, the director of the Initiative for Representative and First Amendment, and we'll get started in just a second. We'll just wait for folks to sort of uh, filter in virtually. Um, but thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. We're super, super excited, excited for this conversation, excited for our in incredible, um, incredible panelists. So we'll get we'll get started in another minute. Awesome. Well, by my clock, it is uh, 12.02, which means I think it is uh, start time. So this, again, this is Kendra Albert, Executive Director or Director of the Initiative for Representative First Amendment. Um, really excited to be hosting this conversation on sort of harassment of women journalists and sort of its effects on uh, the sort of journalism on journalists and sort of our online media ecosystem more broadly. Um, this is a topic that I think is close to many of our hearts um, because both because we can see the effects on an everyday basis on our colleagues and friends who are journalists, but also that they sort of it informs the broader media ecosystem and the world in which we live, because the reality is that independent of what they're reporting on journalists are on the front lines bringing important issues to light, but the risks of that reporting don't lie equally with everyone. White women journalists face much more significant harassment than their white male counterparts, but women of color face harassments based on based on their gender, race, race and ethnicity, or both at the same time. These dynamics have impacts on journalists and journalism, and they create a strong chilling effect on coverage, resulting in self censorship or censorship. Right, um, and you know that's important because not just because of its effects on individuals, but because it changes the stories that get out, the, the stories that are told and the approach that folks have to the work that they do. Um, so we're really honored to have this like rock star panel, um, uh, which I will shut up shortly so that we can get to them, um, join us. Um, so we have uh, Elisa Liz Munoz of the International Women's Media Foundation, Gigi Mohammed from Pan America, Pratika Kachiar, a Gen Z free expression activist who's on the board of the um, Student Press Law Center, and Taylor Lorenz of the Washington Post. And you, I'm not going to read their bios, you can read their bios on the, the on the website for the for the event, but I'm just so thrilled to kind of get to get to be in conversation with them about this today. Even if the circumstances that call us together are crappy, at least the, the company is great. Um, so I'd love to just open kind of I I set the scene a little bit about kind of how we think about the impacts of um, harassment of women journalists. But I'd love to start with Taylor because I know Taylor, you've done both a lot of reporting on this and also sort of written and talked about your own experiences. Um, to just start, like, start us off by laying out the landscape of what you found about how gender-based harassment affects journalists and the topics they cover, and, and you know, we'll take it from there with folks hopping, hopping in as they as they choose to. Yeah, definitely. Um, this is Taylor, um, and I have written a lot about this topic, as you mentioned. Um, I mean, I think the biggest effect that this type of harassment and and terror campaigns um, that people run against women is that it has a really big silencing effect. Um, this is a free speech issue, as I've written so many times, but it's also a press freedom issue. You know, um, women's voices are being intentionally silenced um, from the media. They're not able to tell the stories that they want to tell, or they're not able to cover events or cover things the same way. Um, and also it's hard for them to get jobs. I mean, women are constantly driven out of the industry because of these harassment campaigns. They get framed as controversial and news organizations, you know, will push them away. Um, I recently wrote a story um, speaking to dozens of journalists around the world. And the one common theme throughout the story um, was that none of these women Re received report, uh, sorry, none of these women received support from their very own news organizations when they were going through this. So um, yeah, it, it really cuts down their ability to, to tell, report, it, report out stories. I want to add to that, that thank you. This is Gigi. Thank you, Taylor. And for everything that you said, um, it's a problem for free speech, for free press. And it's also a problem for diversity and inclusion in newsrooms and in the industry, because as both Kendra and Taylor mentioned earlier, 
not everyone is targeted for the same reasons or the same way. Yes, women are targeted more than men in the industry, but also depending on your identity or intersectional identities or per your perceived identities, you're also facing a higher level of uh, attacks when it comes to online abuse. And I think it's very important to say it for what it is, that it's not necessarily only for the topics that you're covering, but also for who you are as a person. And I just wanted to reiterate that. Lisa, if you're speaking, I think you're muted. I knew I would do that. Apologies. This is Elisa. Thank you, Gigi and Taylor. I think that highlighting the identity focus of these attacks is really critical. Another thing that Taylor touched on that I think is so important and something that we're focusing on is the need for a change in culture within newsrooms to accept the responsibility for what is happening to their journalists when it comes to online attacks. I think that we did see a big culture change with regard to physical attacks in the last two decades, um, but we need to see that change when it comes to online attacks and online violence. And really for news organizations, regardless of their size or resources, the absolute imperative to take on the duty of care when their journalists are being attacked. Um, I also would love, so this is Pratika, would love to add on to what Taylor said about the future of free speech and First Amendment issues. Um, a lot of the times when we think about what a newsroom should look like, we don't always uh, think about like the future of, of journalism. Um, and student journalists are that future. Um, I am a student journalist, also a member of Gen Z. And a lot of the times there's this misconception that student journalists are kind of in a bubble. We're not able to encounter harassment um, online or offline, um, but that's definitely not the case. And we cover a lot of the same beats that professional journalists or career journalists do as well. So when we think about what a newsroom should look like in the future, we should think about stronger protections for student journalists as well, especially with the influx of legislation across the country that is now focused on education and um, controlling topics of discussion in classrooms. There's just so much vital discourse that's being threatened. Um, and I think that online harassment is one of those threats to the future of journalism. It really starts at, at the bottom where students are. Thank you so much, everyone. So I want to avoid the kind of like trauma porn phenomenon where folks are required to like regurgitate the like all of the horrible things that have happened. Um, but I did want to sort of I know that some of our sort of viewers or some of the attendees may be sort of less familiar with kind of what what the reality of facing down one of these like, you know, Taylor, as you said, like, right, like terror campaigns looks like. Um, and I'm, so I'm wondering if anyone would feel comfortable speaking a little bit to kind of what what some of some of the dynamics that do occur when folks folks are facing um, facing these down, especially with regards to kind of like I know folks have written about kind of like um, sort of the reality that answering email, not looking at your email or not reading the comment section on your articles is like not something you can just do if you're a working journalist. Um, so I'm, if anyone feels comfortable speaking to that, I would I would be grateful just so that folks who don't quite understand it can uh, get a sense. I can share one thing that I feel like is a big misconception about these types of campaigns. Um, I think a lot of people like, you know, they say, oh, my God, you know, you get death threats and death threats. That's so horrible. In my opinion, I I mean, I, it's horrible and it's not OK, but that's nothing like it's I mean, we get death threats every single day, all day and rape threats and graphic violence. Um, but what's been really hard is what's been happened to my family. Um, my parents have been swatted many times. My sister, um, who is married to a non-white woman, um, you know, they tried to say that she's an illegal immigrant. They called the police on her um, and called CPS, you know, to try and get their child take away, accuse her of grooming. Um, and just a lot of stuff that they've done to my um, my sibling, family members trying to get them fired from their jobs, causing trouble at work, downranking my, you know, family members business um, with bad reviews affecting their business. Um, so it's it's kind of this like halo effect where I feel like anybody associated with me 
gets targeted. Even my best friend, even the girl that took my headshot asked me to remove her name from, um, you know, I was crediting her on my photo and she got doxxed herself and tons of threatening messages. So, um, you know, it's not just us when this stuff happens, it's everyone around us. And it's also our news organizations. Like every single day, I feel like I have to explain something, you know, somebody, some person's reached out and tried to frame something I've done as bad or whatever. And it's just this like extra scrutiny and editors are like, why, you know, thankfully my editors at the post understand, but like, you know, I've been in position where other editors are like, why is this girl, why is there always some kind of trouble with her? You know, why, why are people always reaching out, sending thousands of messages, uh, you know, and I've, I've lost a lot of professional opportunities. I've been disinvited from speaking events, from going on podcasts and stuff because they don't want to deal with the backlash or they don't feel like they have enough security for the event. Because at this point I've had a lot of people f physically kind of make threats. So um, anyway, not to ramble, but I just think, you know, it's not just like mean messages online. Those are disturbing, but that's like nothing compared to the way that, the, you know, the tactics that these people use to smear you and to smear you in the media too, the right-wing media, like, you know, they will smear your name all over and destroy your Google results. Um, somebody paid a, a bot network to message thousands of followers when I got my job at the Washington Post. Like um, somebody had a bot message every single follower of the Washington Post and every single follower of me, um, just that I, you know, that I'm like a groomer and all this, I can't even remember what it said, just nonsense, but it affects your reputation. This, this is, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Gigi. No, please go ahead. All right. This is Elisa uh, Taylor. I just want to say how sorry I am that you have had to endure this kind of onslaught um, and we're here to support you. And I hope you feel that too. Um, the impact on journalists, you know, there, there is, research done on the impact on journalists and they uh, exhibit and, and, and report having symptoms similar to PTSD as a result of these kinds of attacks and onslaughts. And so I think it's really important not only to recognize that the threat does often move into the physical space, but that the impact, even if it stays in the cyber world is the same. And I think that is really, um, it needs to be better understood and it needs to be better addressed. This is Gigi and Taylor, I'm very sorry for everything that is happening. It's not easy at all to deal with that. And I always hope that you feel supported. Um, I wanna to touch on two things that you both mentioned and I also bringing an international perspective to that. I am a journalist, I used to be a journalist covering human rights abuses and social issues in Egypt and the Middle East before I moved to the US and then focus on safety and security. And two important points is that the tactics might actually differ from a place to another slightly. I mean, there, there is a lot of similarities. They might differ slightly, but they have the same purpose, which is to silence and push people out of the industry. And this, as Taylor mentioned and Elisa also uh, highlighted, it affects the livelihood of people. It affects their professional image. It depends on who you are, what identity you have, the types of smearing campaigns. Wow, people get very creative when it comes to that. And the other thing is it does affect our physical safety, but also it, it affects how we see risks. And this is not a, a light thing for journalists, specifically if you're physically covering uh, conflict zones or protests or something like that. Because if your sense of uh, risk and how to manage risk and how to see risk gets affected by the volume of things you're receiving on a daily basis, this is extremely dangerous. So not only what the effects that it has on our mental health and well-being, on our families, on our like physical safety when it comes to moving from the cyber world to the physical world, but also, and I saw that as a, uh, being a journalist and working with journalists, that the sense of how we perceive risk changes because we're, we get used to receiving all of these things and shrug it off and say that like, oh, it can be worse. But then how can we do our threat modeling or risk assessment in a way that is actual? Adding on to that, I mean, I, oh, this is Pratika. Um, adding on to that, I just think that our lives are so intertwined, especially if you look at up and coming journalists, young journalists, Gen Z. I mean, it's hard for us to just get offline because so much of our lives are like 
in between off and online. So when you're trying to break into a field, like we're going to be using platforms like Twitter, we're going to be promoting our work in hopes of kind of catching someone's attention, catching a break. Um, like personally, I use Twitter way more than my counterparts just because um, of student journalism and trying to put my articles out there. Um, it's a way to gain traction. So when you get, like when I get messages on Twitter on articles that I've written or comments that are like hateful, uh, whole swarms of hate, um, a lot of the times it's just like, okay, like I, but I still have to keep using it because I want, I'm trying to like make, make an impact, get my work out there. So it's easier said than done um, to kind of get offline or shrug it off. And there needs to be a better like implementation of support within newsrooms, trainings to kind of combat that because um, being offline is not always an option for a lot of young people. Yeah, this is Elisa Pratika. I think that's really important, but I think what's also really important to know is that um, research also shows that younger journalists are dropping out of journalism at larger percentages than more established journalists because of online violence. And what that says to us is that essentially there's an attitude of, I didn't sign up for this. I don't want this in my life. And I'm just starting out in this field. And so I'm going to redirect myself and my profession. And I want to reiterate what you said about the impact of those decisions on the inclusivity and diversity that we see in the news media. And already at a low, when it comes to inclusivity and diversity, we can't afford to lose anything more, any more diversity uh, in newsrooms um, as a result of online harassment and online attacks. I feel like I can just butt out, this is Kendra, I feel like I can just butt out as a moderator and let y'all keep going. But I, I did wanna lift up something from the uh, Q&A, which is uh, elderly Bialy, who's in her, in her own way, who is a journalist and also an expert on online harassment of journalists says, I wanted to address my support to Taylor and employers should acknowledge this and better empower the voices of journalists like you. So I, I th thought that was worth lifting up. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I wanna uh, pick up where Gigi was sort of pointing out the both the similarities and differences to sort of the way these kinds of attacks uh, play out in the United States and the way they might um, play out elsewhere. Um, uh, so Elisa, I'd love to maybe start with you and then maybe we can go to Gigi to talk a little bit about sort of how what the um, what the IM, IWMF has found I, acronyms, my my weakness. Um, uh, why I run an organization called IFRA, uh, anyway, uh, but um, has found about sort of the effects and variants of this stuff internationally. Um, and then maybe we can go to Gigi and Taylor. I know you've also written about this. So after that, people should just feel free to hop in. Yeah, thank you. Hi, this is Elisa. Uh, when when we look at the uh, the sort of modus operandi uh, from an international perspective, in a lot of ways, like Gigi said, there is a playbook and, and people are just actually literally cutting and pasting that playbook across the world. But I think at least the cases that come to light more frequently or that rise to the top internationally are cases where a government entity has actively piled on, encouraged, started, and is supporting actively an online campaign against a woman journalist, a political candidate, an opponent, name the person, um, backed by all of the power that comes with being a government entity. Um, you know, we obviously saw this in the case of Maria Reza and the attacks against her and many, many other journalists around the world who, um, you know, catch the ire of, of their government. And I think that you can really also uh, draw the similarities to the right-wing news media that sort of acts as a proxy to a governmental uh, interests in the United States. Um, so it's similar to that. It's grasping that power behind that entity and using it. And 
I also want to dispel the notion that these are random or mob attacks. I think that oftentimes they're described as, oh, it's the crazy internet or crazy Twitter. It's not. It's orchestrated and led and directed in a very specific way. And I think it's important for people to understand that this isn't random in any way. Agreed with everything. Uh, this is Gigi. Agreed with everything that Elisa said. Um, the problem, like one of the things we worked on recently was to translate and adapt one of the resources we have at PEN America, the online harassment field manual to Arabic. And in this, in the work that we've done, we, of course, we make sure that it's not a translation only, it's an adaptation, meaning that we work with local organizations to make sure that the content is relevant and reflecting what's happening there. And one of the things which Elisa uh, mentioned is the, the state-sponsored attacks. I think when, the difference that I would talk about between what's happening in the US and in other parts of the world would be the, the element of state-sponsored attacks. Because sometimes like they have way more resources. So the things that we as individuals can do a little bit more limited than what we can do in places that it's not as intense for example. So this is one of the things. The other thing is the gender part of it or the identity part of it is huge everywhere. And it's definitely used everywhere in a way that is pushing a lot of women journalists and non-binary individuals out of the field. And this is the purpose. Like this is, this is as Elisa said as well, it's not random, it's orchestrated, it is connected. And the different tactics, whether from impersonations or to hateful speech or to, for example, um, smear campaigns and stuff like that, it is similar. The tactics might start, like from my experience, for example, in Egypt and in the Middle East, the tactic itself might actually start, for example, in the US. But then, because we know the internet has no boundaries and no borders, it spreads very quickly. The way it's in, like used, is very, it could be different by a government entity or people who, groups who are, they want to put you in trouble with the government. So they publish things impersonating you, saying that you publish these stories, for example, and then they get you in trouble. And the consequences of that in some places can be killing or jail or like other stuff. Thank you both. Um, we have a number of really amazing questions in the chat, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna hit the couple of things that I want to hit and then go to them because there's like a bunch of you know uh, a bunch of really I think fantastic questions about sort of how especially around how folks can provide support or what forms of support are available. Um, but before we turn to that, I want to sort of come back, Pratika, to something you were saying about kind of student journalists and sort of youth journalists more generally. And I think one of the things I was struck by about Taylor, you've reported on this, and one of the things really in your article that stuck out to me was basically, you know, student journalists uh, who are reporting on issues related to a campus that they have a university they attend or a high school. Um, you know, it's not like, you know, <laughs> it's both their, you know, that's a place that they're working as a journalist, but it's also like all their day-to-day -day life in a way that is, you know, maybe similar for some some other forms of journalism, but seems like very, it's very, even harder to get away from. Um, and so I, I was wondering, um, Pratika, if you could talk a little bit about kind of like, again, right, some of the differences or similarities you've seen or some of the sort of um, unique uh, stresses on student journalists who are trying to cover like issues that, you know, are affecting like their lives and the lives of the students around them. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to. So, um, well, for so this is Pratika, and I just first I want to say I attend uh, Northeastern University in Boston. So, um, I have a lot of familiarity with student journalists in my network in co colleges across the country and high school journalists that I've worked with, um, and also through the Student Press Law Center, which I'm a board member for. So, um, to kind of talk about things that I've seen or the similarities, similarities and differences, I wanna kind of start out with laying a basic overview of just a difference that student journalists face um, in comparison to career journalists, which is that we don't have legal protections in at least 34 states across the country um, and at public universities and public high schools. We don't have um, first amendment protections like press freedom rights. 
So we can face prior review, administrative censorship or self-censorship because of our reporting. Um, and in this time, especially with uh, such a tumultuous political climate, there's an impending of reproductive rights and a record amount of mass shootings. We're really on the front lines of covering this on our campuses and our communities. Um, the one example I always think of nowadays is the Missouri State University mass shooting that happened um, a month or two ago where student journalists were the ones breaking the news of it on their campus as it was unfolding. Um, this just shows just the similarity in beats that we're covering compared to career journalists where really taking sensitive issues and putting them in the context of how it affects young people today, where they essentially beat reporters of youth, youth um, and Gen Z, like we're the ones that really know how things affect us. Um, another issue that I always talk about is the amount of educational orders across the country, banning books, legislation that um, aims to restrict discussion of topics in the classroom. I mean, who better can report on that than high school students who are being impacted by that? So student journalists are on the front lines of what's going on in their campus, but we also are so integrated into our campuses. I mean, it's our day-to-day -day life. We go to class, we're reporting on the people we see walking on the field or walking to a party. Um, and in with this increase in news deserts and areas with a lack of local news, we're the ones filling in those gaps. But there's also this chilling effect that we're not really talking about as much because students do face online harassment as Taylor covered in an incredible story. Um, she talked about the, uh, the student at Arizona State who was doxxed and that's just one example. I mean, we're more than capable of facing online harassment and we really need schools and universities to back us up in our reporting. Um, but as a result, I mean, student journalists that I've talked to in at the university level, but in the high school level as well, we're shying away from controversial stories um, because of the backlash we're receiving. I know sometimes I don't even try to report on things that are political because it's not just politics, but it's being attacked for race, gender. And as a young journalist, you also get attacked for your age. I mean, I'm only 19 years old and I get told that a lot. Um, I'm always the youngest person in the room and people make sure that I know that. So a lot of the times it's just an extra weight on top of the lack of legal protections that we already don't have, like the legal protections we don't have, so. Anybody else wanna add? This is Kendra, Gigi, go for it. This is Gigi. Um, Radhika, that's everything you said is just very, very true and it, it hurts to hear that. Um, one of the things, like we've been invited to do some work with some student journalists uh, recently in a couple of schools, a couple of universities. And what you said is resonating a lot because everyone was saying the same thing. Everyone was saying that we are covering the same issues. We are actually uh, being targeted. And I've heard the part about age a lot as well, that we're being targeted like with online abuse, but also our age is used against us as something that is like, you're only this age. And like to undermine the work that people are doing. And one of the things is that I really would encourage and hope that universities would have the conversation about online abuse more. Like I know that now when I was an undergrad, the conversation about safety in general was not there, not physical, not online, nothing. But I know that now a lot of universities are including physical safety, specifically if it depends on the topics you're covering. But I would really, really hope and wish that the conversation about online abuse, trainings that they can provide to people, to students, and resources that they can at least, you know, tell people to go to that place would be something that happens in every class. Yeah, hi, this is Elisa. Um, I think the raising of the different beats that are being covered is really interesting because these kinds of attacks and harassment really did used to be much more associated with a specific beat, you know, politics, conflict, reporting, et cetera. And, and now it's, you're right. It's, it's, we are so polarized that everything, environmental reporting during COVID medical reporting. Um, so it's across the board now. Um, no beat is off 
limits when it comes to um, the capacity for it to become a hostile environment for the person doing the reporting. And I just want to echo what Gigi is saying that, you know, there, there are a significant number of resources out there. And I don't know if we're ready to sort of move on to solutions, but I hate to have these conversations without really moving beyond the description of what is going on in the impact and leaving people without a way to understand that this is not an inevitability. There is, um, There are methods and trainings and ways that you can not entirely mitigate. So don't get me wrong. I, th I think that um, I don't, there's probably no way that an individual can become completely uh, boxed off to these kinds of attacks. I'm sure Taylor has undertaken numerous trainings and implemented tons of digital hygiene strategies and, and still is being targeted. But there are a significant number of resources from our organizations, from nonprofit organizations. We're part of the Coalition Against Online Violence, which has an online violence response hub where the 70 plus organizations that are part of this coalition have banded together to put their resources in one place so that when a journalist is being attacked, you don't have to scour the internet, not know who's providing you the resources. So it's really um, organizations are banding together to support journalists who are being attacked. There's never going to be enough resources, but there are more resources than one would think. Um, so I do encourage anybody listening to at least go on the Coalition Against Online Violence website to see the myriad of individuals and organizations that are supporting this kind of work. Thank you so much, Elisa, for turning us to solutions because we're about halfway through our time. So I think perfect timing to talk a little bit about kind of what support looks like and what the resources look like. And so, yeah, I have sort of uh, two questions before we think we we turn to additional kind of conversations about resources and then and then the, the, the amazing questions in Q&A. And one is just sort of like pretty straightforward. We've talked a little bit about sort of newsrooms or universities stepping up and I I'd love to hear um, maybe some examples of what that kind of looks like concretely, because I do think that, um, you know, I think I've heard and I think lots of folks have heard this sort of idea of like, oh, well, just like, you know, archive the emails or just don't read it or, you know, get off Twitter uh, or whatever. And that's not useful advice. But so, yeah, uh, Gigi, I'd love to start with you um, and sort of hear a little bit about what what actually is sort of good, <laughs> what can, what should newsrooms be doing instead of telling people to like, it, just ignore it, right? Thank you so much. This is Gigi. There are a lot of things newsrooms can do, uh, no matter what size and what resources they have. The minimum thing that anyone can do is some psychosocial support to actually acknowledge the problem, acknowledge that online abuse happens and it affects people negatively and that you need to support them. The first thing you can do is just, just acknowledge that and then check on the individual. Make sure that you're checking on the people that you're working with. And I just want to highlight not only staff, freelancers. We always, always, always forget freelancers. So whoever you're working with, make sure to check on them. The other thing is if opening this conversation about online abuse makes a huge difference. If people feel that the newsroom consider online abuse as an actual threat and a problem, they will be more likely to talk and seek help if they need it. Another thing that newsrooms can do is to provide an escalation channel for people and reporting mechanism for people. So that, for example, if I am facing online abuse as a journalist, what should I do? Who should I go to? Who should I speak to? What resources are available for me? If like in the middle of an attack, I will not be, I will be too stressed out. Sometimes maybe I would want to cry and just not think about what resources are available for me and who can I talk to. So if this conversation is happening over and over and over again about what resources are available for you from your newsroom, what are the support that they can provide you, who are the people that you can talk to? And when it comes to, for example, to reporting something that is happening or notifying the newsroom, we always recommend to have multiple channels for people to choose from. Because sometimes you will not feel comfortable going to your direct editor or manager. So it should be, there should be another way for people to feel comfortable, safe, and seen and heard when they want to say that something is happening to them. 
I want to stop it. There are so many other things that people in newsrooms should do, but I want to give a chance to others to add as well. This is Elisa. I'll just very briefly speak to that as well um, and just want to keep reinforcing the message that no matter the size or the resources available to newsrooms, there are uh, a spectrum of initiatives and policies that can be implemented. So you don't have to be the Washington Post or the New York Times. The IWMF has published a policy guide for newsrooms to support journalists experiencing online violence. And um, some of the newsrooms we've worked with are uh, operating on a very small scale and others have wholesale changed everything that they're doing around security. So it doesn't have to be everything, um, but it has to be something. And I think that um, if uh, you want to share these this policy guide with your newsroom or even with universities, um, I think it's really important to understand that even small steps uh, can go a long way. I just wanna add on to that, this is Pratika. And I think a lot of the times it could even start with like, if we're talking about tangible solutions, starting with J schools, like journalism schools, that do produce um, a lot of reporters, even though you don't necessarily have to be a journalism, at a journalism school to be a journalist. Um, the ones that come to mind, Mizzou, Northwestern, Columbia, I mean, they, they should include trainings and integrate into their curriculum topics of dealing with doxing, harassment, um, and really putting that in there, because I mean, that's one pipeline of producing journalists and having them more aware of this is just another solution. And going off of Gigi's point, newsroom diversity in the grander scheme of things really does help. A lot of the times, um, as we know, newsrooms are predominantly male and predominantly white and having more women and more women of color in positions of power and just in newsrooms would make it for a better and more inviting environment. And it would make it for a more encouraging environment for youth to wanna to actually go into journalism because the diversity problem is not exactly appealing to one of the, mo the most diverse generation to date. Um, and with that, I would wanna say though, that for any young journalists out there who are struggling with a legal um, problem or dealing with online harassment, the Student Press Law Center has a free legal hotline with an amazing legal team that does help any student that comes with a copyright issue or even the smallest of issues to larger ones like online harassment. Um, so, yeah. I want to, this is Gigi, one quick addition to what Pratika was talking about now. Um, the diversity in the newsroom is something really, really important for several reasons. One of them is what you were talking about now. Another thing is that when one of the things that newsrooms can do, and we always recommend them to it, is to have a task force to respond to online abuse, like a group of people. Because what happens normally, to Pratika's point, normally, uh, as we discussed earlier, online abuse targets specific people or like for specific identities. So what happens is in a lot of newsrooms, the burden falls on one individual that is normally whether very used to these issues and then everyone goes to them for support or like because of who they are, because of the topics that they're covering and stuff like that, or that the fact that, for example, they're, they feel the safest to, to talk to. And this is a huge burden to put on one individual. And that's why we always say like, have a task force or a group of people that can rotate and respond to some, like to, to the attacks that are happening. Other, Taylor, go. My way, sorry. Um, yeah, I also think that like just in line with educating newsrooms and as you mentioned, like a team, um, I think also just having support among colleagues and peers, like one thing that has been so helpful is, um, you know, I'm in a group chat with a lot of other female journalists who have encountered this type of stuff. We're all tech reporters, women tech reporters. So we kind of get that. Um, and I think just having that like peer to peer support is really great. I wish it's something that newsrooms would better facilitate. So I think sometimes when you go through this, or if you're at a small newsroom, like you don't have anyone necessarily there. And it's helpful to just have people that aren't your boss or like a 
personal friend that might not understand, um, you know, to, to, yeah, to talk to. So there's that as well. This is Kendra. Thank you for that, everyone. I just want to lift up and sort of come back to something Gigi was saying about support for freelancers, because I think, you know, in an environment where actually, you know, there are fewer and fewer jobs in a newsroom, um, you know, even for folks who are like professional journalists. Yeah, I'd love to hear us just reflect a little bit on what kinds of sort of support or, you know, resources are available like taylor the thing that you're mentioning about sort of actually like groups that sort of of folks you can talk to is definitely something that is not you know exclusive to a newsroom context but whether there are other particular um things that folks who are freelancers or who are not working in traditional newsroom environments but are facing these kinds of attacks um should be uh, like resources that they should be aware of yeah, this is Elisa. Um, I think absolutely go to the uh, online violence resource hub from the Coalition Against Online Violence because it is all there in one place. Also, I know that Gigi's organization and the IWMF both work with individual trainers who will have one-on-one -on -one consultations with journalists um, who ask for them. So journalists should absolutely reach out to our organizations for that kind of individualized support. And the IWMF has also published a mental health guide for journalists experiencing online violence. And I think it's really important to um, take a look at that guide. It has specific exercises that one can do just to address that, to even just have the capacity to confront um, solutions. One just needs to find themselves in a, in a space where they can do that. So I think that, like I said, there are many, many resources out there, um, but exactly one has to be in a place where they can even find them um, or best utilize them. But we do have individuals who are there for you and who can support you if you are confronting a massive attack. Thank you, this is Kendra. Thank you so much. Thank you for so much for that. So I want to sort of go to some of the questions from the Q&A and we'll come back at the end to so sort of like, I think we've talked a little bit about resources, but individual suggestions that folks might have. So there's a couple, I mean, I'm going to, there's a lot of amazing questions. So I'm actually going to do my best to, to moderator's privilege and combine them. So I see a couple of questions about kind of how folks who are not in journalism can sort of act in solidarity or act as allies. Um, and I think this is a, these are great, great questions because I think that there are many folks who are maybe tuning into this. Um, who you know are not working in newsrooms or working as journalists, but who care about this issue both from an, on an individual level, but also on a societal level. So yeah, we'd be here, curious if the folks have thoughts on sort of what actions individual folks um, can take. This is Gigi, and I can start because this is actually one of the trainings we run is how to be an ally for someone that is struggling with online abuse. And we run it with an NGO called Drive to Be. Um, there are a lot of things people can do. And I'm, I'm, I know that this seems like very common sense and like something easy to say, but check on the individual. Online abuse, one of the problems is that it's extremely isolating. It has never been considered a serious issue till recently. The conversation is still even developing. So checking on the individual is something really, really, really important. Another thing you can do as an ally is um, <clears throat> if you have a connection, like a human connection with someone at a social media platform and someone needs some content to be removed, please use that. We have found that if you have a connection, if you know a human being in a social media platform, it might be more efficient and effective to get something removed from uh, the platform. Uh, there are so many other things you can help with. You can amplify their work. You can um, help them, like ask them what they need. Go to someone, provide them with a menu of options that you can do to support and let them choose. Because sometimes, specifically when it comes to things that we do public facing and like, you know, like a big statement, check with the individual. Sometimes I have this, you know, energy that like, you know what, I'm going to stand up against this and I'm going to say something. Other times I want to hide under my blanket and cry. So if you check with the individual, they will tell you at what stage they are and what are they feeling. And it's good to respect and do that because sometimes we have good intentions, but what we do is not really what the individual wants. Um, another thing that you can do, help people document their abuse so that they can, I can turn off my phone, take a break. 
this is one or monitor their comments if they don't want to keep seeing all of the horrible things they're receiving. So these are some tips on things you can do as an ally. This is Elisa. I will just double down on the check with the individual before you do anything piece of this. I think it's really important as advocates um, of women journalists and of uh, online safety, it, it is really important to go to the individual directly and ask them if it's okay that you take action on their behalf or that you amplify support for them because sometimes it is exactly the wrong thing to do instead of the right thing to do. This camera, thank you for those thoughts. If anyone has, oh, uh, Pratika, go ahead. I was just gonna say, so this is Pratika, and um, if like you have the means to as well, and maybe like you don't personally know someone who's underlying or experiencing online harassment or abuse, but you want to help in some sort of way. A lot of the times, um, the nonprofits that are producing these resources like Pet America, IWMF, um, could use support, whether it's donations or um, additional other types of like amplifying th that work. So sharing those resources and really like providing um, like donations to them to help them to continue to grow and create more resources can always be a good way if you don't personally know someone but want to help in some way. This is Kendra. Thank you, Pratika. Um, all right. So I want to jump to another question that really stuck stuck out to me because I'm I'm curious to hear y'all's thoughts. Um, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna name the question askers for the video. Um, how does the culture of journalism and its perspective of abuse as a standard occupational hazard play into this problem? Because I think, you know, uh, multiple folks have flagged like, oh, like, <laughs> and Taylor, I think you were talking about like, oh, like death threats, you know, um, and I, I think both understanding your point in that situation to be that it's not actually the death threats uh, are smaller in comparison to the effects on one's like family and loved ones, um, but also sort of just, yeah, would be curious as to sort of how how the how the culture of journalism and sort of assumptions around sort of putting up with this or this is just part of the job uh has like uh plays into the the sort of problem y'all are describing can i say something on that this is taylor um i you know yeah obviously not to you know would never argue that like it's okay that people are forced to do this but i do think that newsrooms um, normalize it like they don't want to hear about it and I think that um, you know across the industry it's supposed to be this thing where like you're the brave stoic journalist and not only should you not be talking about it or complaining about it because then you're centering yourself um, which people love to say about women um, but you know that you're weak or that you're incapable somehow and um, it's really toxic. I mean, I think we actually have, I mean, when I was at the New York Times, like they had robust support for um, people that were subject to physical violence or reporting from war zones or did other, you know, jobs. But when we had multiple people with PTSD from online harassment and vicious stuff, it's seen as like a lesser, you know, um, form of violence. And so, it, yeah, it's this idea of like, you know, you need to be stoic and you need to not talk about it because talking about it is drawing attention to yourself. And there's this notion in journalism of like, you should never be the story or try and make yourself the story. And the thing, you know, that's so insidious about that is it's not your choice. You know, if, if somebody is going on Fox news and mentioning you and your name is, is in headlines. Like one thing that a lot of extremists have recognized is that in order to discredit an institution, you need to first discredit the reporters. And, and as you discredit these high profile women and people of color, that then adds stigma and sort of discredits the organization. And these news organizations are working off this backwards model where they don't realize that like the reputational harm that we're enduring is an attack on them. You know, it's not just an attack on us. And so um, I just think there needs to be better, you know, speaking of things that these misconceptions about journalism, better understanding of that and better understanding of the fact that people should be able to talk about this. And that's not them making themselves the story or looking for attention or all these misogynistic sort of things that that people levy against women who try and call this stuff out. 
this is Gigi. And one quick addition to what Taylor was talking about that, you know, it comes with journalism and like this is part of the job. Some institutions think that the more you get attacked, the more that you're actually doing good and you're doing the right thing. And I really like, I wish I had this lesson younger, but this does not come with the job. This should not be accepted. This is not something that we should just, you know, take because this is us being thick skinned journalists. This is not okay. It's wrong. Um, it's always this, no one should ever accept that. This is why institutions, social media platforms, uh, universities, everyone should work together to find solutions to mitigate the damage. Elisa said something, it's impossible to prevent it. I, I personally believe that it's impossible to prevent it. That, that means that you have no existence in anything online. <laughs> and I'm not sure if I know any person in my life with no existence online. So even if it's impossible to completely prevent something happening, we can still do stuff to make it better, to make the culture healthier, and to actually talk and have conversations that if I am reporting on something, if I am being a journalist, that does not mean that it's fine and okay for me to receive death threats, rape threats, or any types of like hateful messages and things I'm receiving on my accounts. This is different. I'm doing my job. It doesn't mean that this means that my mental health is not worth taking care of. Yes, this is Elisa. I totally agree. And just to bring in a bit of an international perspective or a perspective from places where attacks, physical attacks against journalists are, are really high, like Mexico or India or Pakistan, where this culture of, of violence against journalists does contribute to the minimizing of online violence. Because I often hear women journalists who are experiencing online violence say, well, but I haven't been killed. Well, I haven't been put in prison. Well, I haven't been beaten up. Um, and so there's even a self uh, minimizing by women journalists in countries where violence is so extreme, physical violence is so extreme. And I think um, that's really why we are so insistent on emphasizing that these two things go together. You can't protect somebody physically and not protect them digitally. This is um, Pratika, and I just wanted to add that um, coming from like a little bit of a youth perspective, I mentioned earlier, a lot of the times um, for like young people, the like being online was the only way to get opportunities. So it's really like ingrained in the culture, I would say of young people starting out in journalism, especially because it's like difficult to get your foot in the door in a lot of places. Um, a lot of legacy news outlets are laying off people in large numbers, and it's just harder and harder to get into the industry. Um, I read this really good Teen Vogue article a while ago about how young women of color gain a lot of opportunities through Twitter. And um, I just want to say, like, it's really part of the culture at this point for um, for Gen Z journalists, up and coming journalists to really like be chronically online almost. So it's hard to get rid of that. And with that comes, as Gigi was saying, online abuse, because I mean, it's inevitable. It's in a, inevitable at this point. This is Elisa, Gigi, and I'm sure you were as terrified to hear that as I was, because one of the first things that a digital security expert will tell you is to separate your personal account from your work account. So I think it's really important even at the high school level to start there um, and, and really keep in mind for student journalists the need to separate the two. Um, part of the damage does come from the inability to, to leave that work attack behind and be on social media as an individual as opposed to as a journalist and so it's it just terrifies me to hear you say that from a very early age these two are commingling and it's going to become increasingly difficult to untwine them um, even in college or in your first you know professional for lack of a better word journalism job so I hope that that becomes part of a uh, more ingrained practice for younger journalists. This is Gigi, and I just want to re-emphasize everything that Elisa just said. 
the younger generation is definitely more savvy with tech and all of these things. Amazing. I'm always, always impressed and learning a lot. The only thing I would say is, as Elisa said, separating the personal and professional. Whether it's several accounts, whether using the accounts for different purposes, you said, Pratika, you're using Twitter a lot for opportunities. Then, for example, if I'm if I would be talking about Twitter for you would be like professional thing more than personal. I, I if I am talking to a journalist, I would say, okay, this is great, but this means that let's keep Twitter for work stuff. And for example, not post picture with my parents or my sister or my dog or something like that, and keep it to an account that is private that is secure and safe so that people don't have access to the information. This is Kendra. Thank you, everybody. And there are a bunch of really amazing questions and I'm sorry we don't have time to get to more of them, but thank you everyone for, for, for coming and participating. I just wanna close, I think one of the things we've shared a bunch of like um, specific resources, but um, already, um, so I'm gonna adapt my closing question slightly and just ask for either like a resource or a takeaway from each of our panelists that you would want uh, someone, uh, you know, to, to sort of take away from this conversation. Um, and yeah, just wanna extend my real gratitude to all of y'all for taking the time to talk with us about this. Um, so maybe we'll start with Taylor, if it's okay to start with you and then we can, folks can jump in from there. Sure. What did you say? We're doing takeaways? Or, <laughs> um, so, I mean, I guess my biggest takeaway on, on all of this and like something I just really hope that people can um, go out into the world is, is just to, you know, pressure news organizations. I think the biggest thing that I found in my reporting, especially this, you know, reporting that I did recently of globally of, of women journalists is that they didn't want to stop reporting. Like despite everything they had been through, they really wanted to kind of continue on with their jobs, but um, their news organizations were the ones that were pulling them off beats or reassigning them, or in some cases, you know, letting them go. Um, and so I think it's just, it's so important that we, that we pressure these news organizations to recognize this problem, build in systems of support and not punish female journalists for being targeted. Um, I think that's, you know, the most important thing. This is Pratika. Um, and I guess my takeaway and a resource would be, well, first is that, you know, to continue caring about this issue, supporting women journalists, World Press Freedom Day is coming up on May 3rd. And the theme this year is that press freedom drives all other human rights. So journalists really are providing access to crucial information to the general public and the support needed for women journalists is definitely something that should remain top of mind. Um, and then for a resource, I mean, I always look to the PEN America online abuse field harassment manual. I think, I don't know, I must have butchered that name, but it's just always, um, always on, on my list. And then SPLC has great guides for covering protests um, for students who may experience um, tension at protests or even police encounters. And then also a cyber law guide for if your newsroom is struggling with any of that. So those are mine. This is Elisa, I can go next. Um, I would want people to come away just uh, really feeling that this is not okay. It, you know, it is not okay. No journalist, woman journalist, woman journalists of color should have to endure what they are enduring every single day. And we should all be accountable to making sure that news organizations, individuals, nonprofit organizations are addressing this because the consequences are very dire for our democracy. Um, they matter. And as far as resources are concerned, I'll just reiterate, you know, Gigi and I work together so much on these issues. The Coalition Against Online Violence has 70 plus organizations that are a part of the coalition and that's a lot of brain power working towards supporting women journalists and ending attacks online. 
This is Gigi. Um, I think one takeaway, which we briefly talked about at the end, is for journalists, separating the personal and professional is something very, very important, and I really, really recommend. And if you need anything, reach out to any of us. We would be very happy to help for resources. Elisa mentioned the Coalition Against Online Violence. We work together a lot to support people. There are so many organizations that provide the support. And if you need anything in other languages, the Online Harassment Feed Manual, we have it adapted and translated to five languages. So this is a good resource for anyone that needs as well. This is Kendra. Amazing. Thank you so much to our panelists for talking, sharing their expertise, their stories, their knowledge. Um, yeah, really grateful y'all were able to join us today. And thank you so much for everyone for listening. Um, and have a good rest of rest of y'all's days. Thank you for covering thank this. Thank you so much. Nice to see everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.